Hello everyone, I just want to make a brief video uh, reviewing our final exam so that uh, you have some notion of, you know, how I graded it, what uh, sort of answers I was looking for, things like that. If you have any questions uh, after watching this video about how your exam was graded, please contact me and we can have a conversation or I can respond to specific uh, questions having to do particularly with your exam. You know, I do make mistakes. Every teacher makes mistakes. And in, especially when you're grading an exam like this, you're using your judgment. And that's something I have to emphasize is that there's judgment involved. This is not a multiple choice exam. This is not a true or false. This is an essay exam. So uh, when a teacher is evaluating student work that's, that's like this, they have to use their judgment. Um, obviously, they have to be fair. They have to be accurate. Um, but uh, there is uh, judgment and uh, judgment can be wrong. So, um, and I could be wrong in just, you know, my input, you know, in, in things like that. I mean, so, I mean, just in terms of writing things in the right space, you know, putting numbers in the right space. So it's always possible that I made a mistake. Feel free, do not hesitate to contact me, it's okay. So in each of the following questions, your ethical analysis should be 250 to 500 words long. Let me, let me start there. That's just a, obviously a benchmark, but that was the, you know, that was the idea this should be an essay form, right? Um, when you're answering a question like questions like these, uh, and you're, you're applying the principles, uh, general ideas of a philosopher to a hypothetical scenario, it's, it's not a fill in the blank sort of thing. It's not like oh, I mentioned this, I mentioned that, so it was right. No, it's the application of the principle. It's not just sort of knowing what the uh, relevant principle is. It's how you actually apply it. That's important. So uh, just let you know, I mean, I had, again, I had to use my judgment in terms of how well I thought you did that. So that's an important part of, of evaluating a, 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 an answer in something like this. It's not just plugging in the right ideas or mentioning them, it's, it's applying them. So again, considerable judgment had to be used. So let's think about the first ethical analysis where I asked you to do a content analysis of um, this uh, situation with Jim and his boss, Jeff. Uh, one of the things that I've uh, emphasized all along, especially in the review videos, for the final exam, the prep videos for the final exam, is that a Kantian analysis has to employ both of the categorical imperatives. That is, a Kantian ethical analysis essentially for us is the application, uh, not just the mention, right, but the application of the first and second categorical imperatives. So that's what we need to ask ourselves about this situation is whether Jim violated either of these principles uh, whether he, whether he, you know, violated the first version or the second version. Of course, the, with the first version, you absolutely need to start by trying to articulate what Jim's maxim of action is in terms of how he treated his, his boss, Jeff. That is, what is the maxim of action? What is his rule of action? And then you ask yourself whether it can be universalized. And maybe the first part is even harder than the second. So uh, I was definitely looking for an articulation of the general rule that he would have been following. And that needed to be put in some sort of, you know, general form. That is uh, something like when it is in your self-interest to humor somebody or deceive somebody or however, you, you know, there's many ways of putting it, then you should do it. And then you, and then you ask yourself, whether it can be universalized. And again, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, articulating the principles is difficult enough. And then asking yourself, <clears throat> you know, can it be universalized? Um, and you can't just say yes or no. I mean, you have to give some sort of argument, as I said. You, know, um, you, have, to, you have to give some sort of reasons for either why it can or cannot be universalized. Because it's not obvious, right? Nothing is obvious, or almost nothing is obvious. So I was looking for that too, not just oh, well, um, you know, Jim, Jim violated the first version of the categorical imperative because his maxim of action couldn't be universalized. Well, why not? Or he did violate it because 
uh, you know, I mean, you, you have to give an argument in support of your claim either way. Of course, the second version of the categorical comparative is whether or not uh, Jim, excuse me, yeah, whether Jim used Jeff as a mere means to one of his ends and not as an end in himself. I mean, that's maybe a little clearer that Jim, well, I mean, I don't know. Did he? I mean, that's the thing. It, you, you can't just sort of say, well, Jim, Jim used Jeff as a means to one of his own ends, so we violated. Well, I mean, how so? Is pretending to laugh at somebody's jokes really using them? I mean, you have. I mean, it's not clear, right? And this is what I was looking for. I was looking for reasoned, um, you know, argumentation in support of whatever position you took. Obviously, there's no clear right or wrong answer here. But the idea is, how well do you actually defend the answers you gave? So, uh, you know, this goes for all of the questions. That it wasn't just a ma matter of mentioning the right things. It was a matter of discussing them. This is why I said. Your answers should be, you know, you should really think about longer answers because you want to defend the choices that you make, and that takes time. So again, I mean, I mentioned the sort of things that I was looking for, and I had to use my judgment about how well particular answers actually did those things. Uh, now we move on to a utilitarian ethical analysis, which I think is maybe a little bit more straightforward, but maybe not. Uh, you know, it's a fairly complicated thing, but uh, you know, thinking about obviously consequences, the, the, the effects on the overall happiness and the greatest happiness or whatever the mayor decides to do. And, you know, the idea that the mayor is, if, if we're doing a utilitarian uh, evaluation, it really is, did the decision that the mayor made, uh, maximize the overall happiness of everyone who has an interest or not? If it did, then it was the right the right thing to do, according to utilitarianism. If it didn't, it wasn't. So that's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The, the, the complication here is how do you actually weigh those things? Um, what I was looking for is some recognition of the complexity of the situation. That is, we have to take into account not only the effects on the happiness of everyone involved, but the kind of effects, right? You know, we have a broad public opposition in, in the scenario to this uh, safe injection site. Uh, so clearly people, if it were open, some people would be made unhappy. But that's a certain type of unhappiness. What about the unhappiness involved in people dying of drug overdoses? Um, that is, there's no clear answer there, I don't think, but you have to sort of acknowledge that. That is, that uh, somebody has a moral... Um, objection to a safe injection site, or someone has a practical one, like it's in my neighborhood and I don't want it. Um, that has to be weighed against the unhappiness involved in dying, you know, or having an overdose or spreading HIV or hepatitis. Again, I don't know. It, that, I don't know what the answer is there. I purposely made it, you know, op, you know, difficult uh, to to figure out. But that has to be taken into account. That is, that, that the interests of everyone, the effect on the happiness, the welfare of every interested party has to be taken into account, and the kind of impacts have to be taken into account. Again, I was looking for subtlety uh, and uh, carefulness in how the actual principles applied, not just mentioning the principle. Number three, uh, the asking to use Thompson's ideas to apply to this situation with uh, Jill and Jennifer. I think that uh, people pretty much saw that I was trying to come up with a scenario that structurally was similar to the kind of uh, the hypotheticals that Thompson. No, I wasn't, you know, I, th I think that most people said, well, this is like the, uh, the famous violinist. Uh, scenario, which it certainly is, although I was thinking more of the Henry Fonda, uh, you know, do, does does Thompson deserve a visit from Henry Fonda if she's got all that can save her is him visiting her and putting his hand on her on her uh, brow. But I think that, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the essence is this, uh, whether or not, uh, I guess in Thompson's idea, that whether or not uh, Jennifer would be doing an injustice to Jill by refusing to donate her blood. Uh, and I think, you know, the answer to that is no. And I, 
think most people could see that. That is under Thompson's idea. The answer to that is no, that is, you, you know, Jill has a right to life, uh, but Jill doesn't have a right to absolutely anything she might need to, to live is one way of putting it. Uh, Jill has a right to life, but what is the right to life? It's not the right not to be killed. It's the right not to be killed unjustly. So, you know, obviously Jennifer wouldn't be killing Jill by refusing, but she would be doing something. She would be refusing to do something that could save her life. So it's a little complicated, but that, you know, that notion that, that Jennifer would not be doing an injustice to Jill is I think a pretty strong outcome from Thompson's uh, essay. I, I, the other thing I was looking for, frankly, because uh, she does discuss it at length, uh, is Thompson's distinction between being unjust and being indecent. That is a really good answer, I think, would mention that as well. That is that it could very well be said that what Jennifer did or failed to do um, was indecent, just as if we were to uh, refuse to be hooked up to the famous violinist for 10 minutes, we may not be doing them an injustice if we unhooked ourselves, but we would be acting indecently. So that ambiguity in Thompson was also something I was looking for. That is that perhaps Jennifer was not being unjust to Jill, but she was being indecent. And you know, Thompson does say that there's a level of decency below which we must not fall. And so asking yourself whether Jennifer did or did not fall below that necessary level of decency would probably be part of, the, you know, a really good answer here. Finally, the uh, Julie scenario um, was really uh, very directly uh, structured to elicit a uh, articulation of Marquis's uh, principle that underlies his theory of the wrongness of killing. And the key one here is that um, Marquis says that uh, killing you is wrong, killing me is wrong. Why? Because it would take away our future. So what we've really established is that it's, it's wrong to deprive someone of a future like ours. And that's the key, right? Um, I tried to make it as clear as possible in this scenario that this fetus, should it be brought to term and become a child and become a human being, would not have a future like ours because of its disability. So I think it's clear on Marquis' principles of, you know, killing, uh, killing anything that has a future like ours, depriving anything of a future like ours would be prima facie wrong. Uh, is uh, pretty clear here that this child does not have a future like ours, so it, it is not covered by Marquis' principle. Mar Marquis offers no reason why this particular abortion should not be performed because the resulting child, if the fetus were brought to term, would not have a future like ours, so he has no basis for saying that this particular abortion is wrong. I think most people saw that for sure. Um, and that was essentially what the, the thing was about, is, is to recognize that, that is, that, that Marquis offers no reason in his, uh, in his uh, essay for the immorality of, a, of an abortion like this. I, I, I think what I would like to see, would have, what I would have liked to see is that um, uh, Marquis would probably also say that it may be wrong for other reasons, and the may be wrong is the, the important part to emphasize. That is that this particular abortion cannot be called immoral on the principle that's the center of his essay, but he always, he's, he's leaving, oh, he would leave open the idea that it may be wrong for other reasons. Um, just as uh, he says in his essay that uh, if, you know, if, if someone, let's say, were terminally ill and uh, could not be said to have a future like ours, on the basis of his principle, it would not be wrong to kill them. However, it might be wrong on, on other, uh, leaving open that possibility that it might be wrong for other reasons. So this is more or less my, you know, what I would hopefully get a sense of what sort of answers I was looking for. In terms of your ethical analyses of this, again, on the one hand, 
I had to use my judgment in terms of how well you're applying the principles, how carefully uh, your reasoning, your, your reasoning in support of the decisions that you made, especially on the other hand, uh, there's always a possibility that I could have either made a mistake in my judgment or an ob more obvious mistake in grading it. So that's it. If you have any questions or would like to contact me, I encourage you to do so. There's no reason not to.